going to be, we're going to get you into it. And uh, I hope you all participate. Open source isn't just for you to use. It's for you to do. <laughs> it's a little different, you know. <laughs> so I'm waiting for your your word, Natasha, before you'll let, I'll let you start up the thing. I don't know how Bangalore operates, so you got to show me. How do we normally get started? Yeah, okay, so uh, I just welcome everyone. So yeah. we have around 16 participants. And OK, let's start because it's 8.37 already, like seven more minutes, uh, seven minutes already passed. So yeah, OK, let's start. OK, so welcome, everyone, uh, to Bangalore Millsoft Virtual Meetup number 32. And today's topic will be releasing open source data view libraries. We have Ryan here as a speaker. Welcome, Ryan, and thanks for taking this up. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Oh. Yeah. So, OK, uh, the agenda for today. <clears throat> Before that, uh, I think there is some change uh, we had that, yeah, organizers. So uh, myself, Nitish, and I work for Accenture. A senior application developer, we have Shyam Raj Prasad. Shyam, do you want to take this up? Yeah, so I'm Shyam Raj Prasad, so working as engineering leader at Tricon Infotech. So I generally I love uh, data wave, so generally sharing the puzzles related to the data wave over the data wave front page also in the link. Yeah. yeah. And we have Bharat and Jyoti as well, Bharat. Yeah, I'm Bharat. I work at Salesforce. Uh, basically, I take care of any point platform at Salesforce. That's pretty much about me. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah. This is Jyotini Barkar. And uh, uh, like I have seven years of IT experience. So I started my career as a Millsoft developer. And uh, yeah, uh, I guess uh, that's pretty much about me. And, um, Welcome, Dan, to the Bangalore Meetup, and really excited for today's session on open source uh, data library. Yeah, over to you, uh, Nitish. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce myself, and I'll give I'll go back to the agenda, right, Nitish? So I'm I'm Ryan Haig. Um, some of you may have been in my classes. I teach on Trailhead Academy, um, Integration Quest. We have our own classes, and we're just getting those started this year. So the more you guys sign up for them, the more we can make some content like this. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to do our own MuleSoft and integration education. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're definitely interested in all of your input. Uh, we have free study groups every other Friday. So today is Friday and it's a little late for you guys, but we have a free study group next Friday, one hour later. So, or one and a half hours later. So it'll be a little late at night, but you're welcome to join. It's real, real low key. We just like to, to learn MuleSoft. Um, and then I do consulting for interesting projects if anybody wants to bring me in for that. So let's, you want to do the agenda? Yeah, sure. So today the agenda will be like uh, the introductions we just had and the data view libraries, uh, open source software distribution and networking time. Uh, yeah. Good. All right, we ready? Yeah. Are you all ready? Audience ready? <laughs> all right, I want you to introduce yourselves. This is a, I love meetups. I've been involved in user groups. We used to call them user groups in 2000. So this is 2024. I am old. <laughs> and in, in 1999, I went to my first user group. It was the XML user group in Washington, DC. And I didn't know what I was doing. I just saw something on an email list and they had an address and I went there and I saw some guy stand up in front of the room with a PowerPoint and do a talk about XML, which, you know, in 1999, that was not old and it was new-ish. It, <laughs> it was not bad technology. Um, and actually at that user group, I had somebody take me aside at the end and tell me soap was bad and I should learn about REST in 1999. He was, now nobody talked about REST really yet. It was kind of um, it was kind of, kind of, uh, uh, but the, the, the connections you make at a user group like this do that, right? So if it's not just, you're introducing yourselves to me, you're introducing yourselves to each other 
and one of you could help another one learn something that changes the next 20 years of your career like that guy did for me at the XML user group in 1999. These, these meetups, these user groups are how relationships get made that change your career. And maybe, maybe you are going to end up with a totally different job or involved in an open source project or something because of somebody else who's here. So thanks, Raju. Um, you can put in the chat. Uh, and I don't know how many of you come to the Bangalore meetup over and over and you already know each other, but there's some people here you haven't met before. Um, so go ahead and put that in the chat and how you're involved in the community. Um, really, these meetups are, are, uh, are, are the way, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about community today. And these meetups are a big part of the MuleSoft community. And the MuleSoft community has, uh, has really, you know, made me more, be able to contribute in a bigger way to our craft. You know, technology and software development is a craft. Um, some of the people in here, my friends that are that, that I've, I've I've been at meetups with before, like Francis and Tony, I've seen you. Guys, we we that's what we talk about. We 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 connect on this this. We we want our craft to keep getting better, and this is how it happens. This is it doesn't happen in the colleges with the doctorates, and it happens between you people and each other and me. So the fact that we're here together, I'm happy to know you. You can connect me on LinkedIn or get in the MuleSoft community Slack and ask me a little question. So that's why you're introducing yourselves. And I'd love to see more of you connect with each other. Um, if you're watching, watching this on a video, you're going to have to do it in some kind of async way. You know, follow me, star me on GitHub or, or LinkedIn me or um, whatever. But it's hard to meet each other asynchronous. So I'm encouraging the people watching the video to not just watch videos, go to the actual meetups so you can meet the other people who are not here in front of the screen talking. <laughs> that's part of the point of the meetups. So come on. Yeah. Thanks, Pravina. <laughs> Good. Do that and introduce it and get to know each other. You know, you might meet your future boss here or your, your future star employee. You know, that's kind of how you how what meetups are all about. Um, I already knew Nitish. So um, Nitish has been, uh, you know, we've been, we've been connected in the community a really long time and he's the guy who got me connected to India. I would have never thought of presenting in India. So thank you, Nitish. It's kind of cool to know people on the other side of the world. And Shem has, has been uh, very generous to come talk at my meetup in Oklahoma City. So if you guys want to come, we're having a meetup in a few hours. You guys are all going to be up really late, but it's going to be test driven data weave in a few hours at the Oklahoma City meetup. <laughs> I'm having pizza. It'll be kind of hard for you guys to fly here in time, but you can watch online, you know. So um, anyway. That's that's part of the work. We're connecting two sides of the world right now. And I think it's really cool. So thanks for introducing yourselves and getting to know each other. Um, we're going to do this online right now. So let's get into the technology. I know a, a lot of you know about DataWeave, right? Big DataWeave fans in here. I wonder, Sh Sham, do you know anything about DataWeave? I imagine you know a few things. Uh, I have to recognize him. Sham is uh, one of my DataWeave wizards from a meetup last year. We did this whole competition and he won the prize and so he got i am declared i declared for all time that she is a data weave wizard one of the three <laughs> um so so you're still a wizard to me um that so when we when we write data weave we can open we, we can if we're going to share it there, there's a, a packaging right so data weave can be put in modules right there's all these like core and there's uh, there's there's strings and there's arrays. You probably go in the documentation, you see all the modules, right? And you probably know you can make your own modules. A module is just a file that ends in DWL. It's on the class path, right? So you can make modules. And if you want to use them from project to project to project, I guess you could copy paste them, but that's not very reusable. Right? So if you want to make it more reusable, you know, we figured this out in the software industry, at least in the Java ecosystem, Mule, Mule is built on top of Java. You make this thing called a Maven dependency, and that allows you to have a file, a jar file that's on the internet somewhere, and your project can go get it and pull it in and use it, right? Now there's more to it. Like that's the technology part. Somehow your computer has to get the file and include the file and have it on the class path, right? So a, a data weave library is the name of that file. So if you take data weave file, DWL modules, and you put them in a jar file and you publish them, 
Maven defines a artifact type called DW library. It's the classifier you see here that lets you let you link the file into your project. So that's important if you want to be able to use it over and over and over again, right? And then you can import modules out of the library into your mappings and do transformations if you have some data weave that you want to reuse. So, you know, when I first was learning data weave, I didn't know why would I ever want to reuse data weave over and over again? Well, you know, data weave has a type system and you can make functions that apply to types and do very powerful things. And we're going to see what this one is. So um, let's let's hold that till the end because I'm going to save all the fun data weave code for the end. <laughs> I, I hope it's fun. It's fun for me. Maybe it's fun for you guys. Maybe it will be if we do this right. Um, first, we got to talk about sharing. Okay, so if I want to... If, why would I ever do that? Why why would I ever share my code with everybody else? I made this cool thing. I can use this cool thing. That's great. Well, maybe some of you guys have heard of this really useful open source project called Mule. Yeah, like it's on GitHub. If you go, <laughs> if you go to GitHub, you can see there's this guy. His name was Ross Mason, and he wanted to make an open source project, right, to be able to share this cool code he wrote. Now, this wasn't data weave. This was Java, right? And if you go look at this project, and we're going to go back, and uh, there's this cool thing in data weave called, called Insights. You can kind of see some analytics on the code history. There he is. His name is Ross Mason. And way back in, it was 2003 when he started it. He moved it into Git in 2006. You can see his kind of commit history here. He, he shared this code with other people. Why would he do that? Well, not to start a company at first. He was a contractor. He did integrations for a bank. And he would go from project to project to project. And he didn't have the code from the last project. It was time to do the new project. So he had to start all over again, over and over and over again. When you're doing code for other people and they pay you to do the code, you're not allowed to take what you did for them and give it to the next person, right? That's not nice. So what he had to do was he took time off and he didn't charge any customers and he wrote something he had gotten some practice, right? He had built this code a bunch of times and maybe even badly, right? Because the customer has their own requirements. So he's like, I wish I had this reusable part that moves information in a canonical format. You guys have probably heard like the mule event, right? The mule message. I want a canonical data model for the data that's moving around. And I want some thread pools and I want some VMQs. Mule started as a reusable little thread pooling and queuing library way back then. And he made it open source so that not just him, but other people could help make it better. And this is, this you've probably been part of a community garden or uh, maybe some of you have uh, have a homeowners association, but there's, there's ways that people figure out to share in a way that everybody can help without taking advantage of each other, right? Open source, we've had 40 years to figure out how to do that, okay? So Mule was originally just like my little library here and like Tony's little library that he put a link to in the chat. It's a way we can share our efforts on things and build on top of each other's work. And across country boundaries, we think a lot of smart lawyers have figured out how we can do it. So let's ask a few questions. If we want to share work, not really you who's listening to this and me and each other, all the if we all wanted to share a little bit of code, and use it in our projects, what's it going to take? It's going to take some technical stuff, right? Like libraries and Maven and ways to import. Where somehow we got to transmit the code and get it from each other, right? And somehow we got to put our changes in so that each other, we can get each other's fixes and know what the fixes are. So we have to get organized if we're going to share work with each other. Open source is like a label for the practices we use to share code with each other. Right. And it's not that easy. There's some things that get in the way. We have intellectual property law and ethics. So if somebody pays me to write some code, I need to make sure that they are OK with me sharing it with you or else I can't. Or I, I need to write it again by myself without, you know, on my own time if I want to share it. So the, some things that get in the way is ethics and you, you have to do it in a way that is above board. Right. So that's one of the things that get in the way. Right. And think about what else gets in the way. Like if you had some cool code you wrote on a project, what what's stopping you from sharing it with me? 
I mean, assuming you want to, right? Now, you might want to because I can help you fix bugs. I can help you make enhancements, right? So this is the motivation. Like, we got a lot of smart people in this room. If we all could work on something, then it would be way better. I have an announcement for the community at the end of the meetup. Uh, yesterday, I had released the new version of Anypoint Studio, and Pranav Devar was the winner last season. I mean, not Anypoint Studio. I just said the wrong thing. I released the next version of Anypoint Speedway. The, the programming challenge and Pranav Devar, who won last season, helped me work on it. Right. I got so we're able to do better things together than we can do alone. So makes sense to have a way to share our work with each other. OK, so open source software is a method for doing that. And there's an organization that defines it called opensource.org. And in order to define how we're going to make open source software, we need to make a policy like we're going to if I want you to have my code or if you want me to have your code, what do you want me to do? Just use it or do you want my help building it? Like, what do we want her to do? What do we want to not do? Maybe you don't want me to make money off of it. Maybe I don't want you to use it to um, build bombs or something like you can make restrictions on what other people do with it if you want to. Right. So that's that's part of the whole open source philosophy is we need a way to share code with each other where we can be clear about what we do want to share and what we do want others to do with it, right? So open source has these things called licenses. Um, they're just legal agreements and they take advantage of copyright law. America has copyright law. India has their own copyright law. All these different countries have treaties. So there's a legal framework we can use to communicate what's okay and what's not okay to share our code. So the, the, the most permissive license isn't a license at all. You can release your code as public domain, and that means it's not yours anymore. So what that means is you are um, you are waiving your ownership of the code. You're saying, this is not mine anymore. So you can do that if you want to. You can release your code into the public domain, and there's some pros and cons to that. And you can read all about that at opensource.org. I just warn you, if you, it, it seems nice because it's not very much effort to release your code public domain. But remember, in some countries, you, you might be liable for if somebody uses your code for something that's really bad, right? So, and who knows, code can be used for all kinds of things, right? So you don't always want to do a public domain license. Like you might, you don't, it's not a license. It's just saying it's not my code anymore. Well, you still, some countries that's not, you're, you're, you're taking, you're taking some personal risk if you do that. Um so there's a there's a there's more licenses where you retain ownership. So the purse permissive and copyright left licenses you can read all about which license to choose when you release your code on opensource.org. Um, those licenses allow you to only allow people to use your code if they agree up to certain things, like not to kill people with it or whatever bad things they might want to do. And you are not giving them a warranty for it. You're not going to be responsible for it. Here, have it, but I'm not. I'm not responsible for what you do with it, right? Those are more permissive licenses. And then there's more restrictive licenses, like Linux is built on a on the GNU public license GPL. And, and that's copy left, which means that the license says, if you use my code, you have to use the same license and give it to other people. You have to. It's a requirement, right? So those are another type of license. So the library I'm going to show you guys today, I didn't do copy left. You can have it for whatever, but it's permissive. I chose a permissive license. Um, so we're going to show a little bit about that. Um, so that's a big part of making code usable by other people is to actually take a moment to decide what they're allowed to do and choose an open source license. It You can do it in a couple of hours, but you do have to take time and decide one, right? Um, so let's let's talk about what it takes to make a data weave project usable by other people. So I decided to call it release ready reusable data weave because I thought it was cute to have a bunch of R's. Um, so some of the things you're going to I suggest that you do to make a data weave library ready for other people if you're going to share it with them. Number one is you should take take full advantage of the type system. So data weave has a very powerful type system. And it makes your library much easier to use for whoever's using it because your, your types are going to be um, be required for all the functions that your library offers. 
So you define the types and then you define the functions in terms of the types. And that makes it so that your library is more understandable and that it helps the programmer do the right things with it <laughs> at the time that they're writing the code. So I, I think an important element of a reusable open source data weave project is to choose, because in data weave, it's a choice. You don't have to put the types in everywhere, right? But I'm suggesting that you should do that. You should put the types in, in all the function definitions. Right? Next thing I recommend is that your library be covered by a comprehensive suite of unit tests. Um, and that's what the Oklahoma meetup is about today. Unit tests do two things. Number one is you think your library does certain things. The unit tests prove it. <laughs> it's not enough that you saw it happen in the playground. You have a test that makes sure that it, because every time you change the library, you could break it, right? So the unit tests provide that safety harness so that the library keeps doing what people are depending on it to do. So a good open source data wave library should have a comprehensive set of unit tests. You can define those in the data wave unit testing framework. Um, so that's another element I recommend. These are all recommended. These are not required. These are just recommended by me. Um, and then the last one I recommend, I found this one while building this library because I didn't want all of my functions to be part of the library's published interface. I wanted some of my functions to remain internal and other functions to be used by my open source, whoever's depending on the open source library. So I found this annotation when I was looking around in Mariano's code. Mariano Acheval is one of the authors of data weave and you look you can see some of the code for the internal data weave implementation and he was using this internal annotation which uh, it it restricts which um, modules are allowed to use your function so i decided to use it it's not 1.0 it's still pre-release so I'm not saying it's always going to be supported. They might change it, but it's there right now. So I took advantage of it. So I used the internal annotation to make some of my functions not available to the user of my library. That way, only the functions that are part of the documentation are available to the users of the library. And these functions, if I want to change them, they're okay. So some of the recommendations I have for making a reusable library. Don't worry, it's not all slides. We're going to go look at all this stuff. Okay, so... Let's actually do some story time. So there's a there's a link in the QR code to my um, GitHub repository with this library in it. Um, I'm going to pull it up in a minute. I'll put a link in the chat. If somebody gets ahead of me and puts a link in the chat, that'll probably be totally fine with me. Um, uh, I'm looking at the... Oh, that's the wrong link for the Speedway, Barth. Just take the test off and repost. <laughs> that's the test site. <laughs> I don't know how that got out. <laughs> but anyway, the real site is up. <laughs> uh, I just was looking through the chat. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah, no, you guys are the first ones to hear, I guess. This is last night it went live. So <laughs> um, so let's do some story time. Um, GitHub.com. This is the open source library that I learned how to do what I'm presenting today, making this library. Um, so I'm going to give you a little the whole story of the thing, but I, you can have a link to it and check it out and help if you want. There's one improvement that I haven't posted in the issues yet. I decided to implement a high performance priority queue data structure in DataWeave. And why would I do that? And why would you care? Why would you want to use it? Let's go through. The, that's what the story is. So story time. Once upon a time, there was this advent of code challenge. So this is the very last day of advent of code this year. So that's the very most recent challenge. And this is an example. It's not the only one this year. It's the example of one that, like many other challenges in Advent of Code, that requires, um, what's going on here? Let me do this. Ah, there we go. Ah, uh, here we go. I, I, was, I was losing my, I'm going to pull that off the screen. So this challenge is, um, you're given a bunch, a, a, a text file that says, it, it's describing a wiring diagram. So there's a whole bunch of wires connected to each other. And you have to figure out what wires to cut to separate it into two parts, right? So it's it's kind of hard to tell from the text, but if you read the text and you take your time, you will be able to figure that out. Um, I'll show you a picture though. Somebody made a picture. The, the 
the challenge ends up describing a data structure that looks like this. Um, the data structure is a bunch of wires that are connected to each other. And there's three wires that you can cut to separate the two parts. And your data weaves job or your code's job is to figure out which three wires those are. So you can make two different um, two different graphs. These are called these are uh, these are called um, spanning trees. It's a type of graph theory thing. You learn it in computer science. Um, it's not that hard for you to start from nothing and go read some Wikipedia, though. So don't be intimidated. It's just data structures like arrays and pointers and nodes. Really, that's all it is. Um, so you could figure it out pretty quick. So you need to figure out which three to cut with a data weave program. <laughs> well, it turns out that the algorithms that will allow you to do that involve finding a path through a graph. So I've got all these nodes that are hooked up through all these little um, edges. These So the lines are edges and the ovals are nodes. Um, and you got to find a path through this thing because that path is going to cross from one side to the other, right? So that allows you to identify the, the ones to cut, right? So in order to find paths in graphs, um, the, the, the algorithms are very inefficient. You can't just loop over the whole graph. And data weave out of the box has arrays, but it doesn't have some data structures that are required to have high performance pathfinding algorithms. And one of them is called a priority queue. Um, it's a, uh, there's a, there's an underlying, you've probably heard of the underlying data structure they use in most languages called a heap, right? Java has a heap in RAM. So a heap is like one type of data. A priority queue is a special kind of heap. Uh, or I'm sorry, the other way, a priority queue can be implemented with a heap. Well, most prior, well, all the priority queue implementations except one that I was able to find before I solved the problem they require you to update the value of an array index. You have to change the data and you can't do that in data weave. Variables are immutable, right? It's a functional language. So I had to go look at, well, how am I gonna make one? I said, we need to have a priority queue in data weave. Well, I found these papers. If you go under the GitHub repo, they're at the bottom on how to make purely functional priority queues. This is the actual paper that I implemented in the in the library. It's not. It's very well known. This is this paper is the one that everybody points back to if you go research how to do priority queues. So I wanted to implement it in Data Weave. This guy, um, I'm at Dev, wrote a really good article in 2014. So 10 years ago, he wrote this really good blog, um, just almost exactly 10 years ago, uh, about implementing it in Scala. So Scala is pretty close to Data Weave. And I kind of read his blog and I thought, okay, this makes sense. I could implement that. And it turned out to be about five times harder than I thought. <laughs> so it's not, you know, I'm a little bit optimistic, but I did, it was pretty hard, but I figured out how to do it. And, and really these papers is what I needed to follow because the papers have, if you really dig in, you can find out that the, the language that the papers are written in, which is ML, is very easy to translate into data weave once you get a hang, get the hang of it. I mean, not right off the bat, but that's what took me five five times as long as I thought was how do I transfer ML? How do I translate ML into data weave when I'm not an ML programmer? So I had to learn enough, but I was able to do it mostly in the paper. I didn't have to go get a book or anything on ML. I was able to kind of interpret the paper. So if you find other functional algorithms that you want to implement in data weave, and you, you, you're starting with ML or Haskell, it, you can do it. It's It will translate to data weave. I will tell you from my experience, it, it's possible to do that. You do have to translate a lot of things, but it's it's possible. So that's that was the challenge. I need to make a, a, prior, a high performance priority queue for data weave. And at the time I had the idea, I want to use it in next year's advent of code. And I want the rest of you guys to be able to use it in next year's advent of code. So. I knew when I started, I was gonna make it an open source library, right? So that was already part of the plan. So I created a repo for it. So let's let's talk about the, 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 the steps. If you're gonna make an open source library in the Java ecosystem, you're gonna have to do, there's some technical things that I already knew about that you guys should know about. Number one is the way you use dependencies depends on Apache Maven. And Maven has repositories. And when I make this data weave thing, I got to put it in a repository where you can find it. So that's 
the that's the objective. I got to put this Maven jar file somewhere that you're going to be able to get it. Like now, I don't have to. Most data weave meetups you're going to go to don't do that. Most of them just point you to the GitHub repository, and you're supposed to fork it and build it yourself. Well, that's a lot of trouble, and that's not how Java stuff works. Most Java teams don't fork repositories and make rebuild their own copies of all their libraries. That's nuts. The way the Maven Java community works is I build it, I put it in a Maven repo, and you use it. So I wanted to do that with Dataweave too. So this library does do that. That's that's the that's the, the plan. So if I want to do that, I have to put it in a special Maven repository called Maven Central. Now, some of you may not know, you probably used Maven Central. Maybe a lot of you know that. But maybe you don't know you can put things there. You can publish your own libraries into Maven Central. It's a globally accessible public repository. And there is a really cool company called Sonatype. They make Nexus. That's their actual money-making product is Nexus. But out of the goodness of their hearts, they host the Maven Central repo, and they have for 20 years. So everybody say thank you to Sonatype. <laughs> That's We have the Maven ecosystem that MuleSoft depends on because Sonatype understands open source. And I was a member of, there used to be an old way that we did meetups online called IRC. So if you want to put in the chat, if anybody's been on IRC before, <laughs> are you guys IRC users? <laughs> That's where we used to hang out online was internet relay chat. Um, so I met all the Sonatype guys on IRC when they when Maven came out, that was 2001. So like a lot of years ago, <laughs> 23 years ago, geez. They they were uh, at a place called Code House, and Code House had an IRC, and we would talk about Maven. And I didn't understand why Ant wasn't good enough, but it wasn't. <laughs> yep, that's how you spell Code House. Um, Maven was better, but Java people were not too happy that you could only build one jar with one repo. <laughs> so. It took some doing to move over to this new Maven model, but here we are 23 years later. Obviously, that was a better model now, right? Sonatype is the company that some of those people who started Maven formed. They formed a company called Sonatype, and they were committed to having good open source infrastructure for the Java community. I have been around now. I've been in, out of the Java community. I've gone to the Go community. I'm in the MuleSoft community. I did some JavaScript community stuff, some .NET community stuff. And the way dependencies work, the way like the thing that Maven does, the way most languages do dependencies is terrible. And honestly, MuleSoft is only maybe an 8 out of 10. <laughs> Maven is a 10 out of 10. Sonatype is a 10 out of 10. Any point exchange is okay. It's an 8 out of 10. And I, I'll get what I mean by that in my estimation because what makes open source code reuse work is trustworthy, long-lived, shared repositories where it's public, anybody can get it, and there's a clear license and there's cryptographic evidence that the author hasn't, that it's not a Trojan horse or a virus or been hacked by the Russian KGB. Like, you need to know that you can trust that piece of software. Maven figured that out 20 years ago, and the rest of the world is still catching up. If you go in Maven Central, let's go in Maven Central together right now. I you, you don't have to believe me. I don't you're gonna yourself <laughs> go look. Like if you go in repo1.maven.org, this is Maven Central. It's a, a website, it's not the best website you've ever been to because the it's not for humans, <laughs> it's for computers to use. So it looks like that, right? So if I go and look at my library in here, I'll show you guys some some evidence of what I'm saying. This is what you want to look for when you use open source. There's a way to find my library, a canonical name of my library. 0 0.1.0 is the version number. That version will never change. There's a promise that if you're using 0 0.1.0 forever, that will be the same file. You can cache it locally. It's okay. That's part of the, the one element of a good code reuse system. Number two is all of these files that I'm sharing with you, they have digests and checksums. So look, there's a MD5 here. If you download the jar file, you can run a digest algorithm and see if you get this, because you might or you might not if somebody hacks you. So let's say some ter terrible 
you know, hacker gets a hold of your computer and they replace the jar file, well, it won't come up with this number anymore, right? And that means your software can stop working, right? Maven can check, and Maven will do that. The Maven tool will check the checksum, and if it doesn't match the checksum, it will give you an error message. That's good. That's safe, right? So that's that's another thing. And then the last thing is you have a PGP signature that I made with my own computer using my private key personally. So this is evidence. What, what the signature is signing is the jar file, right? This is evidence that I, my, the copy of the jar I uploaded is the same copy that you downloaded with my cryptographic signature. Nobody else can fake that. So that's all built into the Maven infrastructure. Now, MuleSoft AnyPoint Exchange has this. It's It supports this. You can do this. And so that's why I said they're like eight out of 10. They used Maven. Good job. Like that's a very powerful, safe, secure way to share software on the internet, right? Maven is, is the best one. Docker Hub is close, but some of them are not so good. And you're going to find language to language to language. They all made up their own way of doing software distribution. Now, Linux is really good. So Debian Linux does the same thing, but they do it for binaries. So there's you know, when you when you find those Debian, the, the Debian software distribution method is just as secure as Maven. So it's not only Java that figured it out. Linux people figured it out also. Um, so um, very good. Thanks for the post, Tony. You guys want to put that link in the uh, in the, the meetup um, notes or whatever in the email after the meetup. Okay, so if you want to put stuff here, you got to do all that. No, this isn't my website. I can't just go put files here. In fact, it wouldn't be secure if it was my website, right? If it was my website, then I could put Mule on there and I could put whatever I want in the Mule code. And then you would have an insecure system, right? So instead, um, you want it, it's it's essentially managed by a company called Sonotype. So this is where you do it. If you want to publish a library at Sonotype, you have to sign up for an account. Now, this is the old one because I've been on it a long time. This is you, you don't get on this one anymore. They're migrating everybody to a new one. So I'm going to show you this one just so you see how it works, and then I'll show you the new one. If you want to publish anything in an, in an open, in central Maven so that everybody else can download it without having to fork the repository, you have to apply to get an account on here, and they do it fast, like two days, less than two days. You can have an account on here. And then once you have an account on here, you apply to open up a repo. That's a Jira ticket, although that's changing. It's been for many years. You open a Jira issue for them and they make you a repository. And here's all the repositories. And anytime that you, um, let me show, well, how do I get to mine? Uh, Essential, this is a good one. Anytime that you are responsible for a, for a project, what you are responsible for is a group ID. So you can own a group ID and you can let other people have access to publish things to that group ID. So I own software.hag, hopefully that's my name, right? <laughs> and you can see the different, there's multiple group IDs under the project, right? And here's my data weave PQ library and here's all the versions. So whenever I want to publish a new library, I use the Maven tooling and it puts the jar file here and then it goes through all these quality checks. And that's done by Sonotype for free. Like I don't have to run a GitHub action or a Circle CI project or Azure DevOps or Jenkins. They check all the quality on their side. And that's a very important step because that's where all the security stuff is checked. <laughs> so it's not just, you don't just trust anybody to do their own security. They have their own centralized security for all these libraries, okay? So you publish the library and they they check all the security um, and quality checks that the PGP sums are all there and everything and that you include your documentation and everything. And then uh, that then it goes to uh, there goes through a life cycle. So I may be able to show it a little bit when you OK, you can kind of see it at the top. Um, whenever I really I don't have a new version to release right now, but when I do release a new version, a new repository appears here with my, my changes. And then when I'm done uploading things, because it allows me to upload more than one thing into a single repository, like maybe it's two different jar files with a bunch of different files in them. So it gives me a chance to finish uploading everything I want to upload using Maven on the command line, not through the website, through command line. And once it's all uploaded, 
um, then I can promote it. Now, in order to promote it, all the checks have to pass. So it goes through a workflow where it checks all these things. And if it fails, you're done and you have to drop the repo. So you don't always release every repo. You fix things if they're broken. And then when you're finally happy with it, you hit the release button and then the process begins. I've seen it take up to 48 hours. I've seen it take as little as 45 minutes for my repository to go live on Maven Central. So you don't want to depend on it happening too fast. <laughs> it could be two days before it goes live. But this is this is like globally available software. So I'm not complaining that it takes for two days. It's like sometimes it might take two days. Um, so that's the process of getting something released on Maven Central. Um, so that's that's almost everything. Like now I've got it somewhere that you guys can get a hold of it. Well, that's not enough, right? Because you, in order for people to use my library, they have to know about it and know how to use it. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, it's going to take some instructions. So I used GitHub for that. And that's these days, 2024. Now that's pretty much the most common way people make open source software documented for other people. I guess the big projects have a real website. I haven't made one for my little library yet. So I'm just using GitHub as a way to do it. So what I did was I made a readme. A couple of things I'd like you to notice about the readme. Number one is I picked what my open source license and hopefully from earlier, you know why you want a license. <laughs> so I tell you what you're allowed to do with my project. And I didn't just pick a license and stop. I picked a license. The one I use most is Apache license because it's an attribution based license. So you can use the code. I'm not responsible if you break all your stuff with my code. Um, and uh, you don't have to pay me if you make money on it. All of that's in the Apache license. But you do have to say that my code is in your code. You have to have a you have to have an attribution. You have to let let other people know that this has this library inside it. Um, so it's not, you know, it's on the packaging. You know, it's like the ingredients list in your food. So when you read the license, it doesn't take that long to read. I will note, point you, you scroll down to the bottom. This license has some instructions. Here's how you apply it. If you don't follow the instructions, then it's not going to work. You have to follow the instructions. So I read the instructions and it said you need to go put these, you know, the following notice enclosed in brackets, like in your work, right? So I attached this bit of text into all my files using comments. And it says to do that right here. So for example, if I go to my main like code file in here, you're going to see there's a comment at the top that says what the license told me to put in there, right? And that's how you actually apply your license. So part of using a license is following the directions. Um, so that's that's it. Number one is you put a license on there, right? Number two is you want to tell your users how to use your library. And there's two ways, right? With Maven, I did Maven Central. So all you have to do is put a dependency in your code and you can use my library like that. Right. That was the whole reason for the Sona type Nexus repository manager thing. That was all in order to make this work. Right. You can, all, but the Maven dependency method doesn't show up when you search an exchange in AnyPoint Studio. Right. It doesn't have the tooling in, in integration that MuleSoft has. So I gave the other way. If you wanted to put it in your private exchange, there's some instructions. Right. The instructions are, are 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 documented really well by Alex Martinez. So just go read her instructions. That'll make it show up when you go to the search and exchange in AnyPoint Studio. So if you want that for your team, you need to publish it in your own repo. So it's an alternate method of installing the software. So I have both documented. And if you make a library, you might want to put installation. And my code is open source. So you can go copy paste my readme and fill in your own stuff. Why not? Right? So that's one way to one way to do it. Um, then you want to tell people how to use it in their actual code. So I put the steps with copy buttons. Like you want to explain the way to actually use your library. Um, so I made the steps here, and you can have kind of a uh, instructions for using it. So I did all this reuse for using the library. And then the next step is how do people contribute? So this is my current improvement I need to make. I have not given very good instructions on helping me enhance the library. And I got that feedback in my last meetup. I don't think he's here. That was from Max. Um, so there is a way 
to I could give much better instructions for how you could make an enhancement or a bug fix. Um, and I, I take pull requests, but also like I should tell you that I want unit tests and, you know, <laughs> that you have to put the Apache license in your changes and all of that. There's more to it. So I'm not accepting a pull request until a certain number of criteria are met. And my improvement to this readme is I need to tell you about that. So right now I'm telling you it verbally, but yeah, I'm going to write that in the readme. And that's the next thing I did on GitHub. And the final thing I wanted to point out for you is these badges. So GitHub has this tradition of using badges on open source libraries to indicate um, readiness and for use and reliability. So I put two on here. I put one for the unit tests. Um, that comes from, from my uh, GitHub Actions. And I put one on here for the Maven Central version so people would know you can go get it from, from Maven. Um, there's a badges. <laughs> we don't need no badges. <laughs> so then, yeah, thanks, Tony. There's a there's a site called shields.io. Let me go show you that. If you want to make your own badges, you can use uh, shields.io to put the badge on your readme. And that, that's how you can make your own badges for a data weave library. So that's the story. Once upon a time, the end. That's how we, uh, how I did the the data weave library. And if you, uh, this one is for priority queues, um, maybe that would be a different meetup to tell you more about what priority queues are and why you would want to use them. I hope I hope the picture gave you a sense of it. Right? <laughs> They're also really useful for mazes. I did a maze thing on Twitch. Um, that was fun. They're useful. There, there's a lot of uses for this data type. But maybe my encouragement more is there's a lot of other enhancements to data weave that you could make. There's things that are that we need in the data weave world that are not there yet. And one of these days, at least Anna Felicetti's um, uh, her her response, her her um, what she says publicly is that data weave itself is becoming data open source, and it's been over a year, so it's taken them a long time to do it, but they have not changed their story yet as far as i understand and this is my i believe her i think the mulesoft uh, the the mulesoft people at salesforce are still planning to make data weave open source um so that means it's not only going to be data weave libraries that we as a community can help with i know tony you had a thing with csv and i talked to mariano about it and there's an improvement to the csv format that tony needs that we could make and we could do just the same thing to do that, right? And maybe we could make a new format to support video or who knows what, right? There's a lot of things the community might want that MuleSoft's not going to make. And it's going to take us being good at this practice of making open source software. Yeah, that's who. And a fellow study. Yep. She's in charge of DataWeave right now. Um, but we, yeah, we are going to, in order for it to be worth it for MuleSoft to make it open source, we're going to have to step up and get involved and participate. And I just wanted you guys all to know how, what it takes. It doesn't take, you know, it takes some technical stuff, but you're all capable of doing it and you're all capable of helping. And most of the good software we use these days came from people like you and me sharing our code with each other. Like the whole internet that we build on comes from open source participation from people like you and me. So it's going to take us going out and doing it and being good at doing it and helping each other and using each other's projects and contributing to each other's projects. That's what it takes for us to have nice things. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, that's the, uh, that, that's, that's the reason I want you guys to do data. Weave. Um, so anyway, uh, this is, this is, you, you are part of a global MuleSoft community. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk at your meetup. And I want you, you know, if you, if you want to get more involved, uh, there's a little QR code at the bottom for, for getting more involved in the community. Otherwise, thanks for the airtime and the, 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 the invitation to be part of Bangalore group, um, number 32, right? You guys have a lot of meetups. So, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, privilege of, um, of getting to hang out with you guys and talk about software. Thanks, Ryan. It was our pleasure having you here. So we have any questions or notes? I got to see a bunch in the chat. I was kind of watching it. <laughs> yeah. 
So, yeah, that's the prepared stuff. We can hang out a little longer. I do have an, a meetup coming up in half an hour. So. <laughs> okay. Is there any fee involved in setting up for a Sonotype Nexus Repo Manager account? There is not. Let me give you the new link. Um, so, Sonotype has opened up a new server. Sonotype, let me go give you the link to, to signing up. It's free. It's totally free. They just, I don't understand it. Their company is very cool that way. <laughs> Um, so here is how you sign up to get a Sonatype account. And this was 